Think about the last time you had a cold. How exactly did you know that you were sick? You had signs and symptoms like congestion, a sore throat, maybe a cough or a fever. And what this told you was that you needed to rest, drink a lot of fluids, and maybe reach for that bottle of cough syrup. But what these symptoms also tell you is that your immune system is working really, really hard to try to fight off that infection. It's trying to get you healthy again. But have you ever stopped to think about how these cells that make up your immune system actually know that you're sick in the first place? I like to think of the immune system like a security guard or a police officer who's patrolling a building. She's walking through the halls and looking into various rooms, trying to assess whether or not the building is secure or if there's some sort of threat. Our immune cells do the same type of thing. They patrol our bodies, moving through our bloodstream and into our lymph nodes and other tissues. And while they're at these sites, they're looking around to see whether or not there's some sort of infection they need to fight off. Today I'm going to be talking to you about a special type of immune cell called a T cell. And I think T cells are really interesting because the way that they search for infections is in a very specific manner. What I mean by this is that we have lots of T cells in our body, and some of these T cells are particularly looking for certain types of infections. Like this cell here may be looking for the virus that causes the flu. These cells here may be looking for the bacteria that cause strep throat, and so on. So let's look a little bit more in depth at this T cell that's looking for the flu. How exactly does it know if the flu is there? Well, the cell has this receptor at the surface that's shown in red. And what it does with this receptor is it sort of uses it as its eyes and ears. The T cell moves around in the lymph nodes and the tissues, and it kind of grasps around with the receptor and samples its environment to see what's there. And if it comes into contact with a piece of the virus that causes the flu, you get this sort of nice puzzle piece fit, a perfect shape match between the bit of flu virus and the receptor. And this tells that T cell, there's a threat. I need to become activated, and I need to recruit other immune cells to this site to get rid of this flu infection. But if you think about it, most of the time, we don't have the flu. We're perfectly healthy. But our immune cells are still in this sort of patrolling function. They're still sampling their environment. But what they're coming into contact with are just totally innocuous pieces of our own cells, our own tissues. And so you don't get that nice puzzle piece fit, that sort of perfect shape match. But you do get a little bit of interaction of this receptor with its environment. And so in my research, I'm really interested in understanding what kind of information the cells get from these contacts with normal, harmless things in the environment, and how this can go wrong in the context of disease. So you could imagine that if this T cell sees this harmless little green diamond here and thinks that it's a threat even though it's not, that cell might become activated and start to mount an immune response. But this would be really bad. It would be as if this T cell is kind of sounding a false alarm and calling in all the troops, all the other immune cells, to fight off an infection that isn't actually there. And so this is what happens in a class of diseases called autoimmune disease, where the T cells and other cells of our immune system mediate attack on our bodies, even though there's no harmful or infectious agent present. And so there are many different types of autoimmune diseases that can affect humans, some of which are shown here. And it's estimated that between 15 and 24 million people in the US alone suffer from these and other diseases. So it's really important that we try to understand what kinds of things can go wrong with T cells and other immune cells that can lead to this kind of disease. And so I've been particularly interested in lupus. Now, lupus is a really complicated disease. Some patients present with this sort of classic malar, butterfly-shaped rash on their face, but not all. It's only about 30 to maybe 60% of people. Other patients have problems with their kidneys, their brains, the levels of iron in their blood. Um, so because lupus is such a complicated disease and there are so many different manifestations of it that can occur in patients, this implies that there are probably many different types of things that can go wrong. So it's important to study a lot of different types of models of lupus to figure out all of the many different types of things that can go wrong. And so for my research, I was interested in using one of these models of lupus to try to figure out what is actually causing these T cells to sound the false alarm. Why are they starting to attack our own normal, healthy bodies? 
So it's very hard to do this kind of research on people. So instead, I turned to a mouse model. Now, mice don't get that classic Malar rash. And even if they did, it would probably be pretty hard to see with all that fur. Um, but what we can do instead is perform a simple blood test to see if the mouse has a disease that looks like human lupus. And so in this mouse that I started studying, we looked at its blood and found that there were antibodies present that can cause harm to our own tissues. So that meant that this mouse had lupus, or a disease that looked like lupus. And then when I looked at the T cells in these mice, they actually looked activated. They looked like they were responding to some sort of infection, but the mouse was not sick at all. It didn't have any virus or bacteria around. And so to try to figure out what was going on in the T cells of this mouse that was causing disease, I looked at the mouse's DNA and wanted to know whether there were any genetic changes, any mutations that could be contributing to the disease. And so by sequencing the DNA, I found that there was a single base pair change in this gene called RAS group 1. And so I wanted to start investigating how altering this molecule, RAS group 1, could lead to these disease features that we see in the mouse. So what does RAS group 1 actually do? Well, the gene encodes a protein that's really important for turning signaling pathways on inside of cells. So if we have our T cell here, and let's say it's that flu-specific T cell from before, if this T cell sees a bit of the flu, it knows it needs to become activated. So what is going on with RAS group 1? Well, RAS group 1 activates a couple of downstream signaling pathways, one of which is called RAS. And the other is called mTOR. And for reasons that I'll explain to you later, I became very interested in this mTOR pathway. Now, mTOR is a kinase, so it phosphorylates downstream proteins to turn on signaling. And mTOR signaling is very important for a number of different processes in T cells, including their activation. But let's take a step back. This example here is showing you what happens when that flu-specific T cell sees and interacts with the flu virus and becomes activated that way. But most of the time, as you know, thankfully, we don't have the flu. We're not always sick. And so I was really interested in whether this signaling pathway from RAS group 1 to mTOR was also present in cells from just a normal and healthy mouse. And so to address this, I took T cells out of normal and healthy mice and I measured the level of signaling through RAS group 1 to these pathways, RAS and mTOR. And what I found was that RAS group 1 does send a low level of signal to mTOR in these normal healthy T cells, but not to RAS. So it seemed like this mTOR pathway was really important in the normal and healthy cells. And what this also told me is that T cells can experience a range of mTOR activity. So in the context of infection, they get a really strong signal. And in a normal and healthy T cell, they get a lower level of signal, but it's not zero. There is still a little bit of signal. And I think this is particularly important for T cells to perform this sort of police officer security guard function. It helps them patrol and stay alert so that they're ready to respond and activate really quickly when that infection does come. So once I established that RAS group 1 seems to send this low-level signal to the mTOR pathway in normal cells, I wanted to know what was happening in the T cells from that mouse that had lupus, because I knew that those T cells had a mutation in this gene, RAS group 1. And so what I found when I measured the level of mTOR signaling in these lupus T cells was that it was actually a little bit increased relative to a normal or healthy cell. And so this cell was sort of somewhere in between the normal context and the infected. And so this made me really wonder whether having this little bit of increase in mTOR activity in the lupus T cells was what was actually causing the disease. So to address this question, I took advantage of the fact that there is a drug that can block or inhibit the activity of mTOR. And this drug is called rapamycin. And actually, the word mTOR itself stands for mechanistic or mammalian target of rapamycin. And so what I did is I took this drug and I administered it to the mice that had lupus and this RAS group 1 mutation, as well as to normal, healthy, wild-type mice. And then I measured the level of the T cell activation that I observed in these animals as sort of a readout of whether they had disease or not. So if I just looked at the mutant mice without giving them any drug, as I told you before, there was this high level of T cell activation. The mice kind of looked like they were responding to an infection, even though one wasn't there. But if I treated the mice with this drug to turn down the mTOR signaling, 
I saw a reduction in the amount of activated T cells in this mouse to about the levels of what you see in a healthy, normal animal. And so this really showed that the lupus-like disease in these RASGRIP1 mutant mice was caused by that increase in mTOR signaling that I observed. Now, another feature of autoimmune disease can be the accumulation of sort of specialized T cells. And what do I mean by this? If we think back to that security guard, um, she's kind of generally walking around the building looking to see what's wrong. But if she saw that there was a fire, she would want to specifically bring in the fire department and not just the police force. And so you can think of these specialized T cells as those firemen that would come in. And so if you look in a normal and healthy mouse, you have a few of these specialized T cells. But when I looked in the mouse with the RASGRIP1 mutation, I found that there were actually a lot of these specialized T cells, which is depicted in this graph here. And if I administered that drug, rapamycin, to turn down the mTOR signaling, I found that this population of specialized T cells decreased. So it showed, again, that these specialized T cells were accumulating in a manner that was dependent on having some mTOR signaling in the cells. And so now I've shown you that there's this signaling pathway from RASGRIP1 to mTOR that seems to be increased when you get this single nucleotide change in RASGRIP1. And this leads to a lupus-like disease in the mice. Now, I told you that mTOR signaling controls T cell activation and that I saw that the T cells in these RASGRIP1 mutant mice looked like they were activated. And I also saw an accumulation of these specialized T cells that may be due to increased proliferation, which is also a process driven by mTOR. But I wanted to know from here what might be going on inside the cell at the molecular level that could be causing the T cells to become activated. So not just the signaling, but what was sort of connecting the signaling to the activation. And so from here, I started to look at this process of translation, so going from mRNA into protein, because this is a process that's known to be very tightly controlled and regulated by mTOR signaling. So again, translation is this process of going from mRNA into protein. And to see whether translation might be altered in my RASGRIP1 mutant mice, I started by looking at one single gene called GATA3 as a proof of concept. Now, GATA3 is known to be very important for the regulation and development of these specialized kind of firefighter T cells. And so that's why I chose to look at it first. So to see if GATA3 was regulated at the level of translation, I looked at its levels of mRNA in just a normal, healthy wild-type mouse compared to the RASGRIP1 mutant. And I didn't really see any changes. It looked like they had about the same level of mRNA. But when I measured the protein levels of GATA3, I found that the mutant T cells had about twice as much protein. So it seemed like there was something happening between this step of mRNA to protein to cause that to accumulate. And so I thought this might be due to an increase in translation in the mutant T cells. Now, this data was really exciting, and it made me want to look at more and more genes. But instead of just picking ones that made sense to me, I wanted to take a more unbiased approach and instead look at all of the genes in the genome. And so to do this, I used a really cool new technology. The first step was to just isolate all of the mRNA from T cells to get a representation of which genes were expressed and at what levels. And this is called RNA sequencing. But to look specifically at the mRNAs that are being translated, what I did was a technique called ribosome profiling. So I took the ribosomes out of cells and isolated the mRNAs that are bound to those ribosomes, so only those mRNAs that are actively being translated in the cells. And then I sequenced that RNA as well. And by comparing the level of expression in the ribosome data set to the mRNA, I could get a sense of which genes were being regulated at the level of translation. And I was really excited to see that there were around 600 genes that seemed to have increased translation in the mutant T cells compared to the normal wild type ones. And this is a really ongoing active area of research in my lab now to try to figure out what these genes are doing in the T cells and how they may be contributing to the disease. And so this is an exciting open question that we're hoping to answer later on. So by studying this RASGRIP1 mutant mouse, I was able to learn a lot of different things about T cell biology and how it relates to disease. 
I showed you that T cells have this sort of range of mTOR activity and that normal healthy T cells have a little bit of mTOR signaling that helps them perform this patrolling function. It helps them stay alert and ready to respond. But if you have a mutation in this gene, RAS group 1, and it increases the level of mTOR signaling a little bit, this can cause that T cell to increase its mTOR activity, and then that T cell can become more activated, can start to become more specialized, and can, start to, can contribute to the lupus-like disease that we see in the mice. And we think that this is due to mTOR's regulation of translation in cells. And so this is what's sort of causing the T cells in this model to sound that false alarm. They have this little bit of elevated mTOR activity, and they're, instead of knowing that everything is fine, they are contributing to disease. And so this research, I think, leads to a lot of really interesting questions and future directions. So is this phenomenon of increasing the level of mTOR activity in a T cell only applicable to this model of lupus? Or is it true for other types of autoimmune diseases as well? Is this sort of a universal or a unique phenomenon? Additionally, I looked at the mTOR pathway um, in these T cells from this lupus mice and saw differences, but perhaps other signaling pathways are also altered in normal T cells in the context of autoimmune disease. And perhaps these other pathways also sort of tune the reactivity of those cells. And in general, I think this research shows that performing basic research to understand signaling pathways and general T cell biology is a way to get a deeper understanding of autoimmune diseases like lupus. And hopefully one day we'll contribute to our ability to design better, more rational therapies to help patients. <laughs>